Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Along with Jim Garrity of National Review, I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today as usual. And Jim, you and I have been doing this podcast for over four years now. And for the first time today, by the time most folks hear this, we can say... Republicans control the United States Congress. They have controlled the House for the past four years, but once the swearing-ins happen today in the U.S. Senate as well, the Senate will be in Republican hands. It's a long time coming. We will obviously see much better cooperation between the House and Senate and hopefully some good, solid, conservative, limited government legislation headed to the president's desk, which he probably won't like. But it gives America a clear choice and gives Republicans a chance to pass good legislation. You know, Greg, uh, I hope listeners can tell the the sound is a little clearer. Uh, (laughs) The quality of the podcast is a little better. Our voices are a little cheerier. And I don't know about you. When I woke up this morning, I looked out the window. There just seemed to be a much sweeter sound to the cars skidding off the road in the ice. Uh, (laughs) For those of us in the D.C. area, we had an inch of snow and obviously the apocalypse has has occurred uh, and no one could get to work today. But no, this has been a long time coming, as you said. I'm thinking back to 1992 when Bill Clinton was elected that on Obama's inauguration. there's, There's a Freudian slip on Bill Clinton's inauguration day. Rush Limbaugh had the theme, America held hostage, day one, and counting down you know, into the uh, Bill Clinton presidency. And then I believe he had done, you know, America the way it ought to be once the Republicans took over. And so we are one step closer to the way it, uh, America the way it ought to be. Let the headaches for uh, President Obama commence, even if we end up in a, spending two years sending a lot of good bills to Obama's desk where he vetoes them. I think that's a teachable moment for the country. Uh, I think that will only... Uh, further sour the Obama legacy. He will be see, come to be seen as obstructionist, and um, you know I, I think it'll. It, I, I think the the evidence is mounting that President Obama doesn't know how to lead, doesn't know how to compromise, doesn't know how to strike a deal, and uh, you know if he wants to change that perception, this is his chance over the next two years. I look forward to all the uh, media reports about how this poor president was saddled with uh, a Congress led by a party that was. Uh, from the opposite party, because no other president's ever had to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Ask Bill Clinton how easy he was. Ask George <laughs> W. Bush. Ask Reagan. You know, I mean, ask uh, George H. W. Bush. You know, this is this is kind of the norm, and only Obama acts like it's some sort of like absolutely insurmountable obstacle. <laughs> all right, on to the bad martini now, and of course, in addition to the legislation that virtually all Republicans uh, will get behind, there are some sticking points. Uh, out there as well, one of which will come up in the next couple of months, and that's what to do about funding for the Department of Homeland Security. As you may recall, it was the special part of the Cromnibus bill. That was the cur part of the omnibus bill. That was (laughs) Homeland Security funding uh, only goes through the end of February. The rest of the funding goes through the end of the fiscal year at the end of September. And the reason for that is because Republicans wanted a chance to specifically target funding for the president's unilateral amnesty, and they wanted to do it when they had control of the House and Senate. Uh, On Fox News Sunday, John Thune, the South Dakota Republican senator, was specifically asked by Chris Wallace, are Republicans prepared for a government shutdown showdown, specifically over the Department of Homeland Security? We now have the responsibility to get things done for the country and to make sure that our government is funded, but funded in a way that's consistent with Uh, what I think the American people said in the November election, and that is they want the Congress more involved in these issues and not have the president overreaching consistently as he has now in in the past with executive power. So Thune's kind of covering several bases here, Jim. He's obviously pointing out that they think the president overstepped his bounds, which most Republicans and even non-Republicans, I I think, would agree with. At the same time, though, he says under no circumstances will we uh, shut down the Department of Homeland Security, which most people would also disagree with. But then it leaves the question open, why did we set separate expiration for funding for Department of Homeland Security in February if in the end the president's going to get what he wants here. I don't quite understand why they can't do, let's do a funding bill for everything in this, you know, the Department of Homeland Security that we like and nothing that we don't like and thus make it impossible for President Obama to implement his, uh, his thing. And if he vetoes it, he vetoes it. And we can say, look, we passed a bill. You did that. You haven't shut down the entire government. That basically this Obama likes to use the term hostage taking. Well, Obama is basically going to say in these circumstances, well, if you don't give me what I want and my executive amnesty, 
I won't sign any spending bill for any part of the Department of Homeland Security at all. And that strikes me as not a reasonable position. And if you have to, like we, we broke down each one of the appropriations bills, or at least that's the original plan, start doing each section, do the FAA part of the bill, do the, you know, you can do this. <laughs> You're in Congress. You make the laws. You make the rules. So I, Mr. You know, vehemently anti-government shutdown guy, doesn't quite understand why this is such a, a difficult ma- area for them to manage. Obviously, look, today is the day of the, of the vote for Speaker. There's obviously been a great deal of uh, drama and passionate, angry angry comments of the last couple of days. Ultimately, Boehner is likely to be reelected as Speaker. And I think here's the problem. For most of these budgetary fights, there are three problems for Republicans. Most Americans aren't really that upset about what Republicans are upset about. If they are, they might say, tell a pollster they're upset about it, but they really don't drive, you know, it's not a driving, motivating, they're not passionate about it. Two, Obama is a ruthless demagogue who will shamelessly, you know, claim that this is, you know, you're, you know, stopping kids for cancer and stuff like that. Um, and the third uh, aspect is obviously the media will cover for Obama. You, you can replace uh, John Boehner as speaker. You still have those three factors. And, and I have yet to see a, a way to overcome that until, unless it comes involves replacing President Obama. And then you can, you know, once you have the bully pulpit, then you can begin educating the American people on why we need to cut the budget, why we need to do stuff like this. And I think Republicans have not yet figured out how to manage these spending fights, um, how to get leverage in them. And I think, that, you know, the statement you see from Thune there is probably the a, a great illumination of that. All right. Well, on to the crazy martini now. And Jim, there were several wonderful parts, many wonderful parts, actually, to the midterm election. Some were the seats that we picked up, of course. Others were the ones that Republicans and conservatives held that Democrats thought they had a decent chance of winning. One of those was the seat held by New York Republican Congressman Chris Gibson. Uh, he was targeted by the billionaire founder of the uh, poke button on Facebook, a guy named Sean Eldridge. In the end, it was a disastrous campaign for Eldridge. Uh, he really uh, was a pathetic candidate. Gibson won by like 30 points. And the day, or I guess the morning before he's sworn in for another term, Gibson's like, you know what? I'm going to retire after the next two years. So not sure how much he's going to be motivated to, to, to do all that much over the next two years. Some speculate that he's more interested in perhaps running a a uh, statewide campaign for Senate or governor in 2018. Uh, nonetheless, it, it's always good to let people know you're not going to run again as early as possible. But before you're actually sworn in, that's a little bit earlier than usual. Yeah, I've kind of come around to this, and uh, I kind of like this this approach. And if, the more I think about it, Greg, because look, we've all seen guys announce they're retiring right before the deadline, and the only person who can get the signatures in time is their nephew or, <laughs> or stuff like that. That's usually how things worked out in you know in Detroit. Um, so there's a certain, you know, like it's nice to give everybody in your district a heads up. If anybody's thinking about running for Congress, to give them plenty of time to think about it and prepare a campaign. And, you know, if he is thinking about running for, for office in 2018, either in a senatorial race or a gubernatorial race, he may need two years to prep for that. So I'll give him a little bit of uh, credit for that. It does seem like he's a little bit of weird to say, thank you, constituents. It is my honor to represent you. And I announce my retirement. <laughs> right. Hey, you got some place you got to be, you know, it's it's he's checking his watch throughout the entire campaign. It was a little strange. So now we see <laughs> on to bigger and better things for Congressman Gibson, perhaps. Jim, enjoy the uh, dawn of the uh, Republican majority on both sides of Capitol Hill. And uh, hopefully the birds will still be chirping tomorrow. I'm pretty sure they will. Or the, or the cars will still be skidding <laughs> tomorrow, considering the pace of, of, of plowing here in Northern Virginia. Yeah, it's pretty pathetic. Uh, Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Live.